Hi everybody, I'm Susan Mulvihill. Welcome back to my vegetable garden. Well, I was out of town last week, so I didn't have a chance to shoot a video, but I definitely need to give you an update on everything that's been going on around here. As you can see, our vegetable garden looks quite a bit different than you've seen in the past, so I definitely need to show you what's going on here. And as a reminder, I live in Spokane, Washington. It is hardiness zone 5B, and we're about 300 miles east of Seattle. Bill and I have been cleaning up the garden for this season over the last couple of days. And we have taken out a lot of things. So this bed and this one here are where our two paste tomatoes were growing. And I have to tell you that the tomato plants came through for us after all. You'll recall that we had a very cold, wet spring, which the plants did not like at all because the soil was cooler than it should have been. And then we transitioned right into a hot summer. So that was stressful for the plants as well. They took forever to bloom and set fruit. We had a lot of blossom end rot. Even though I mulched the soil with lots of grass clippings so that the soil would retain its moisture better, I gave it extra water, did everything I should have done that should have worked, but we still had a lot of blossom end rot. But we did get a large harvest, and because our nights are cold, they're in the 40s, we haven't had a frost yet, the tomatoes just weren't finishing ripening. So I went ahead and picked all of them and moved them down to our basement for the last of the ripening. So I want to take you down there and you can see what I've done. Now I'm down in our basement, which is a little bit messy. That's why I'm only showing you the tomatoes. But this is how I ripen green tomatoes. You can see on the left side of that rack, I have newspaper on the floor with a whole bunch of green tomatoes on them. And that's because I ran out of room. And then in this orchard rack, which came from Gardener's Supply, I love this method because it's so handy to put them on the drawers and then be able to pull them out to check on them and to grab the ones that have ripened so that I can make tomato sauce or salsa or whatever. So this works really well. It's a space saver. Now, of course, I need to move in all of the cured winter squash and pumpkins, and I'm trying to figure out where those are going to go. But definitely don't give up on your green tomatoes. Just bring them inside, put them on sheets of newspaper in a dark area, and they will ripen for you. Be sure to check them frequently, though, just in case some have molded. Now, even though we had a lot of successes in the garden, you guys, I have to tell you and be honest with you, I think I have lost my ability to grow normal, healthy carrots. I cannot believe this. So here's the problem, and I'm gonna pull one up right on camera so you can see what I'm talking about. But the thing that carrots do not like, well, actually there's two things. They don't like a lot of nitrogen that makes their roots split and fork. They also do not like too much water. Because it got so hot, Bill needed to increase the amount of time our drip irrigation system runs. And it's on all of the beds. So if you increase something by 10 minutes, this bed gets 10 more minutes of water, this bed gets 10 more minutes of water, and so on. Well, I was thinking that because it was so hot, they probably would appreciate the extra water. Turns out I was wrong. So let me show you what a carrot looks like when it's gotten too much water during the season. And this is so maddening because I've been so proud of this nice, healthy bed of carrots. At least I thought they were healthy. Okay, so let me just randomly pick a carrot here so you can see what I'm talking about. Now here's one that has split into two roots and actually the root has started to split also. Okay, so here's an example of nothing. That's pretty pathetic. Okay, so here is an example of what I'm talking about. First of all, you'll notice it's got three legs and this has split on both sides. 
Let me show this to you up close. So here's what it looks like. Isn't that awful? So it has split open. It's got the multiple roots on it. This part is pretty hard to eat or use in any kind of recipe. So that is really frustrating and I fear a whole lot of carrots in that bed are going to look just like that. Darn it. Let's talk about winter squash and pumpkins for a moment. As you can see, I am curing some in our little greenhouse, but they're not the ones that I harvested in a recent video. These ones actually finished maturing just in the last week. But as a quick recap about curing your winter squash and pumpkins before you put them into storage, is that you want to put them somewhere that is light, warm, and protected from the weather for two weeks so that they'll keep in storage for a very long time. This is totally worth your time to do, and I did explain it in more detail in my recent video. Now, while we're looking in my messy greenhouse, I wanted to point out and remind you that we have a couple of large pots of sweet potatoes growing in here. Bill also grew one in a pot outdoors. I think we'll be harvesting them in the coming week and I will definitely do a video on it so you can see how well they performed. This is the first time we have grown them in containers. Last year was the first time that we ever have grown them and we had them in a small raised bed. So stay tuned for that. Now two plants that are still in the garden are artichokes. These are ones that I started from seed this spring and they produced really well for us. Now last winter we overwintered two artichoke plants in pots in our garage. Our garage is insulated but it gets very cold in there. It's not heated and it worked really really well. I just watered the pots of them about once a month and they made it through the winter just fine. So I'm going to show you those plants that are sitting in pots on our patio and we will overwinter all of them with the same type of a method and hopefully we'll have a nice artichoke planting for next year and lots more artichokes to enjoy. I also wanted to point out this really cute garden flag I have. I got it from studiom.com and no, I don't have an affiliate relationship with them. But I was thinking, oh, you know, I need a new garden flag. And I'll tell you what, they have hundreds of them. They're beautifully made. And I thought this one was just so perky with the flowers and the toadstools. So you should check them out because there are so many nice ones that for, are for all of the year, whether they're holiday ones, fall ones, spring ones, summer garden, and so on. Here are those two artichokes that we overwintered from last year. And you can see they're still doing great. Now, I realize this is not a very scenic view here, but I didn't want to forget to tell you the results of our late season planting of corn as a succession planting. It worked great. We ended up getting, we think, between 30 and 40 ears of corn from the plants in the bed. They were delicious. They fully matured, and that was 30 to 40 ears of corn we would not have if we hadn't tried this experiment. So I heartily recommend that you see what you can do to get extra plantings in your garden during the season and get more produce from your garden. Now the last thing I wanted to show you in the vegetable garden before we move on is how my little winter garden is doing. I've got a red Siberian kale. I've got a type of endive growing in here that has been growing like crazy. And I also have some butter crunch lettuce over this way. Now, you probably are noticing the little toy snakes. I've got a couple in here and down on the ground and that's because we left the hoop house open while we were on vacation and the quail decided to come in and nibble on some of the leaves. 
That is so annoying. And that's also why I have Wiley, our little coyote decoy, trying to keep them out of the hoop house. So that's helping a little bit. But anyway, the plants are doing really, really great. So I'm very excited about that. You know, I grew this type of lettuce last year. I'll put the variety name up on the screen for you. And what I liked about it, the leaves are just a little bit tougher. I kind of hate to say tougher because that sounds like it wouldn't be very palatable. But these are delicious. And the reason I like them is since the leaves are just a little rougher, that means slugs don't eat them. How cool is that? But apparently birds do. So I'm trying to keep the birds out for the time being. I'm going to keep this open until it's getting too cold and that way I can keep the plants warm. But these are all very cold tolerant vegetables. And the other thing I wanted to mention is when I planted these in here, I was thinking, well, cabbage butterflies aren't going to fly in here. Well, yeah, apparently they do because on just a couple of plants, I noticed some little holes in the middle of the leaves and I looked underneath and there was a teeny tiny little green worm. So that is something that is easy to take for granted late in the season. You think, ah, oh, this is a fall winter garden. We're not going to have any cabbage butterflies anymore. Well, apparently we do. <laughs> Now I wanted to show you the current state of our three bin composting system because look at all the materials in there. I do want to remind you that I shot a video on how to compost because it's very simple. Sometimes we tend to overcomplicate things, but it's not that hard. And this is a great time of year to get into composting. The main reason I wanted to show this to you is because I wanted to explain how Bill and I clean up the vegetable garden. So as you can imagine, there is a lot of green material and some dead plants like old corn stalks and so on that we have built up. And what do you do with it all? Well, we have a chipper shredder. And what we do is we put it on kind of a coarse chopping and we generate all of this material and build compost piles in each of the bins. Very simple, great way to use up all the materials from the garden. Now I know some of you are going to say, well, which brand of chipper shredder do you recommend? To be honest with you, I don't have any to recommend because they tend to jam. And of course, when you have a lot of green materials, that happens more frequently. So we do it in a very slow rate and we pretty much keep it going the whole time. We have a Brushmaster chipper shredder right now. We've had it for a few years and it works eh, fairly well. Uh, before that, we had a Troy built one. That was kind of so-so. So I can't say, oh man, this is the best chipper shredder ever. But I did want to explain that's what we do in order to chop up all of the debris coming from the garden. Now, if you have a sturdy lawn mower, maybe like a lawn tractor or something like that, you might consider chopping up things like leaves that have fallen from your trees and some material from your garden. But the main concept is that the smaller you can chop up your materials coming from the garden, the more quickly they will decompose. So I built up these piles. They've got lots of brown materials like the old corn stalks and leaves and so on, lots of green materials. I was real careful to moisten the piles as I was building them. And this pile already, just from yesterday, is at about 110 degrees. So definitely there's some activity going on in that pile. But I heartily recommend composting. And when you make your own compost, you know exactly what's in it. In our deck containers, I grew three different plants. Merlot star petunias, which are amazing, lantanas for the hummingbirds, and a beautiful red canna lily. Now, I can't overwinter the petunias and the lantanas, but I can overwinter the canna lily bulbs. And this is a great way to save money and also to save a really pretty color of cannas. 
I do have videos on the process of overwintering them. It's very simple, but the brief description of it is I need to wait until the plant gets lightly frosted. I know that sounds counterintuitive. I'll dig them up, rinse the soil off the roots, let them dry out a little bit, and then I'm going to put them in a box that is filled with shredded paper, move it down to our cold, dark basement. And they will keep just fine through the winter months. And then in February, I'll pot them up, keep them indoors until the danger of frost has passed, but get them going again. Very simple. Now you might recall that I had the geraniums or pelargoniums growing in these picket planters on our front porch. You'll notice they are gone. So I did not toss them. I put them through the overwintering process. I've got lots of videos on the topic and they are now being stored in a box down in our basement, just like the canna lilies will eventually be. So for the time being, I've got some pumpkins and winter squash that didn't quite ripen yet. And I thought it would be fun just to set them in pots. I've got some pine needles in here too, just for a little filler. And I'm waiting for our grocery store to have some colorful squash or gourds that I didn't grow and put them in some of the pots. But I think this is a great way to use up some of the extra things that I grew. And it says, yeah, a crazy gardener lives here. <laughs> Well, that's the garden update for now. I hope your garden did great this year. Thanks so much for watching today, and I'll see you next time. Happy gardening.